Unlike satisfiability testing, the n-queens puzzle is actually not a true NP problem since there are polynomial algorithms out there that allow us to solve it. Nonetheless, I believe that it is nice to solve the n-queens puzzle uh, with a declarative approach such as ASP, simply because you pose one of its rules after another and just describe the problem and not actually how to find the solution, push a button and get a solution. Okay, although I believe that most of you are familiar with the n-queens problem, let's briefly review it. The goal of the n-queens puzzle is to place n-queens on an n times n chessboard so that no two queens attack one another. Well, here's just an example with a 5 times 5 chessboard and in more detail the idea is to put these five queens on this board so that there are no two queens in the same line, the same row and neither this, these diagonals in this direction nor the other ones, right? And I'm pretty sure that all of us have come across this problem in the undergraduate studies when they had to learn about backtracking algorithms. And so perhaps you give it well, a couple of seconds to think about how you would solve this problem in your most preferred programming language. So what have you been thinking of? Well, I'm afraid since I put the word backtracking in your ears, You've been thinking about a procedural solution in a language like, I don't know, Java, Python, C++, or like. And with the idea that you put one queen after another, and whenever you put a queen, you make sure that it is not attacked by the queens you have been placing so far, right? Anyway, that had been my idea when I was an undergraduate. Okay, now let's just to sync us a little bit, let's actually look a little bit and at how this works to get also a feeling a little bit for, for, for the, the, the problem. Now, uh, I just uh, proceed row-wise, so I put a queen in one row after another, and so the first queen I just put in position 1-1. One, one. Okay. Now, for the second queen, that is for the one to be put in the second, in the second row here, this position is blocked by a horizontal attack, this position is blocked by a diagonal attack, so we have three alternatives, this one, this one, and this one. And since it's about avoiding attacks, I just put the second queen as far away as possible, and so I put it here. Okay, bang. Now, for the third one, what does it leave us with? So, we have here, this one is blocked, and this one is blocked, so we only have to look actually in the rows where we have put, no, in the lines where we have put no queen so far. So this one is blocked by a diagonal attack. This one is also blocked by this diagonal attack. So there is actually only one possibility, and this is this one here. So we can put the third queen only on this position here. Let's do that. Bang. Now what is left for the fourth queen? Again, we just have to look in lines. Now I got the lines right, uh, where there's no queen. So this one or this one, well, this one is ruled out because there's an attack on the diagonal, and actually this one is ruled out because there's also an attack on the diagonal. Hence, there's no position left for uh, putting a queen in this, in this row, but we have to put it there. Hence, we have to, to revise this choice that we made, but keep in mind that this was the only alternative, so we don't only have to remove uh, this guy, we also have to remove uh, the queen, or at least uh, remove the queen from the position in the second row. And keep in mind, there I just put it in the, in, the, in the most farthest position, but there were three alternatives. This is an alternative and this alternative, and so let's, let me just put it in the one that is almost as far away from the first queen, this one. Okay, now what is left for the, what, what positions are left for the third queen? So we can we could put it here because there's nothing in this uh, there's no queen in this line but there's a diagonal attack same here there's a diagonal attack from there and from there double attack Ooh. but this looks pretty good so here again and this was the position we had before right so let's put the queen again there and this is again the only possibility that is left okay now there are two possibilities for the fourth queen we can put it here ah no doesn't work diagonal attack but we can put it here because there's no queen in this line of course there's no queen in the row we, this is by construction because we proceed row wise 
Uh, and there is no diagonal attack, right? So nothing here, nothing there. We're good. So let's put the queen there. And now there's only one position left uh, where the, there's, there is, there's only one line left without a queen. So this is the only left position here. And again, no, well, of course, no um, attack in the line, no attack in the row. And also on the diagonals, there's no attack. Great. We have a solution. Hmm, not bad. But actually, what have we been doing? Right? So we have actually solved the problem algorithmically. And actually, the, 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 some of you who may have Googled the polynomial solution already, uh, we could have done this deterministically by well, taking, replace a, a first queen. Then we move uh, the queen like a horse in chess. Up, right, then up, left, up, right, down, right. And this way we could have actually produced a solution. But again, what are we talking about? We're talking about strategies, algorithms. Well, actually, this is an AI course. And we think about currently, at least I talk to you about how to solve this problem in a procedural way. So we are actually programming after all. It's us who gives the intelligence, who thinks about, oh, the cutest thing. No, that's not what we want to do. We are in a course on artificial intelligence answer set program, which is a declarative approach, where the idea is, no, we don't want to care about solving problems. The computer, actually this guy here, should solve the problem. So the only thing we should do, we should pose the problem. And that's what we will be doing now. So let's start posing. So the idea is now just to declare the rules of the n queens problem, actually now one after the other, and slowly develop the problem. And then just push the button and let the computer solve the problem for us. Okay, the first thing we have to do is to define the field. Again, this is modeling. You may define it one way or another. I try to be here very, let's say, pedagogical by really unrolling things in a very easy way. And we will see at the, at the end of this um, part here that there are other ways, actually more effective ways to do certain things. Okay, so we want to represent an n times n chessboard. Well, I just take a unary predicate row, a unary predicate call, call, and say there are instances from 1 to n for each of these predicates. And this defines the field with n rows, n columns. And actually, coming back to uniform problem representation, well, the problem instance somehow is captured here only by the n, right? Because all the rest is generic. It is a problem encoding, we encode the class of n queens puzzles. Okay, this just said then for once and for all. So there is no real di division here of instance and uh, problem class. Good. Now that we have done that and we actually put this in, in a file called queens.lp, we can just call Klingo on this, on this file and see what happens. So if we do this here, so that's again uh, the terminal prompt calling Klingo on, the, on, this, uh, on, on this file that we have just filled. And now we say that the constant n should equal 5. So we more or less follow our example from the beginning. We have an n times 5 times 5 chessboard. And we, if we push the button, we just get more or less an expansion of this, of this notation, which we've already seen in the coloring problem. You may, you may remember the way we defined the nodes back then. And we have, after all, five rows, five columns. That's all that we have. Okay, now this board looks a bit lonely. Let's pop, populate it. So, and populating means we just place queens on the board. And we do this with a choice rule. And this choice rule is again, as we've seen already before in the uh, satisfiability testing uh, example, we, we have a choice that is unconstrained. We have no lower bound, we have no upper bound. So in this set here, we will have for, for all rows, for all columns, keep in mind five rows, five columns, we have 25 atoms after grounding of form queen ij from starting from queen 1 1 up to queen 5 5 and we can now make an arbitrary selection among the elements of this set we can select no elements three elements 25 elements right and this captures then our guess 
This provides us with a solution candidate which places an arbitrary number of queens on the board. Now again, uh, now our file has grown by this additional line here. Uh, let's just uh, ask Klingo about it. Now again, calling Klingo with, this, with, with, a, with, a, with the content of the file we have just uh, seen. And again, looking at it five times five chessboard. And here now the three means just give me three solutions because there can be many. And we get three solutions and more or less whenever we have a queen, here for instance there's a queen 1-1, one, one. this means a queen is put at position 1-1, one, one. here one is put at position 2-1, and since there is no atom with predicate queen, this means this is actually a candidate that has no queen at all. You may actually wonder why Klingo enumerates things in such a way that it only enumerates there are no queens and one queen, and why don't we see right away something with 13 queens or I don't know what. Well, this is actually a technical detail since the heuristics of Klingo says if I have to pick an atom and I have then the choice to make it true or false, I first make it false. And this is a, a heuristic decision. And guess why this is perhaps not so bad? Because stable model semantics answer set program works under the closed world assumption. So there should be more things that are, that are set to false because we don't know about them than true ones. So that's a heuristic detail. And now I zip it again. This is just a detail. Anyway, we get three solutions. Let's just visualize this. So this is the first solution. And again, there is no queen on this board. Then this is the second solution. There is a queen on position 1-1. One, one. And then there is a queen on position 2-1. Now, again, Placing queens on the, on the board is nice, and, the, and keep in mind there will also be solutions where it's full of queens. There. We have queens everywhere. There are 25 queens. It's just that we don't. I, I don't bother showing them to you now. Uh, now let's actually say that really we want n queens on this board. In our case, we want five queens. Now before doing this, let me make a general remark about the generate and test methodology that will help us actually in developing the rest. One thing that I like very much about it is once you have written your generator, in our case here this choice rule, you can just assume that you have a solution candidate at your fingertips. So no matter how it looks, you have one, right? And now you pose conditions more or less on the, on the validity of this candidate that it actually is a real solution. And that's exactly what we will do now in the sequel. So now what we want to express now is that there are n queens on the board. And again, you have your solution candidate. And now we say, oh, this guy is invalid if it has not n queens, right? And we do this with an integrity constraint, right? So this integrity constraint says it must not be the case that the number of queens unequals n. Well, we often have five, so that there are not five um, queens on the board. So this will reinforce that we only accept guesses here, or solution candidates, that place exactly n queens on the board. Well, again, when, when, you, when, when, we, when you have uh, advanced a bit more in the course, uh, you may actually write this differently, and you may ask yourself, oh, can't I just well, restrict the guess right away so that you get n candidates. And yes, you can. You can write it like this. You can say right away that I only want to select exactly n elements, but I want to proceed here stepwisely in a modular way, and I only want to add constraints one after the other. And interestingly, if you write this internally, this construction here will be uncompiled to this one. So there is no gain in performance if you write things in that way. So let's just keep on working modularly. Anyway, uh, giving either of the two to Klingo results in, the, in, in solutions that only have n queens, as I show you here. Again, now I only want two solutions, and we get here one solution and here, here another one. Let's look at them again, as we did before. So the first solution, oh, oh, put all queens in the first row. Of course, we didn't rule out that there can be several, several queens in the same row so far. And the second solution, well, here we only have four queens in the first row, but there is one in the, in, the, in the second row. And you see a lot of constraints are violated here, right? So we have these queens all attack each other. 
these queens attack each other, then here these two queens attack each other. The only constraint that is not violated is that there are no two queens on such a diagonal here, right? But well. Okay, now let's, let's actually eliminate these uh, solution candidates by first saying that there can be no horizontal and vertical attacks. Just as before, this can be achieved by adding integrity constraints that rule out solution candidates that comprise horizontal and vertical attacks. So doing this with these two guys. So the first one says, it must not be the case that we put two queens on line i, but positions i and j, because this would mean the two queens attack each other on this line. And in the same way, the second constraint forbids uh, attacks in the same row, because here we put two queens in the same row, in this case j. So these two constraints eliminate all solution candidates that uh, have horizontal and vertical attacks. And in this way, the other way around, we forbid such attacks and everything that comes out now uh, does not um, have such vertical and horizontal attacks. But let's check and what, what has Klingo to say to that. So. Launching Klingo now on this file and just looking at one solution gives us this guy here. And that's what we get. And well, <laughs> it's exactly what we asked for, right? So we wanted to have a board populated with five queens and no two queens on the same line and the same row. It's just that up to now we have not to told Klingo anything about diagonal attacks. And that'll be the next thing to do. Again, we proceed in the same way. So we have our solution candidate and now we add integrity constraints that rule out invalid solution candidates. And now we rule out uh, diagonal attacks. And I don't want to go too much into details how this works. The idea is more or less you, you check that there are not two queens that you put in position ij and ij uh, i prime j prime. Uh, and that satisfy actually this constraint here. And don't let me go in details here. That, that's something that you can verify yourself. You will actually see whenever you take two positions, ij and i, i prime, j prime, and that they, whenever they satisfy this equality here, uh, then uh, they actually sit on the same diag diagonal. And the first one is for, let's say, for this diagonal, and the other one for these diagonals, or the other way around, I don't remember. But anyway, we proceed in the same way to forbid diagonal attacks, right? It's again, I think this shows, this listing shows very nicely the idea, right? So we more or less have our instance set laid out. Then here's the generator and here are all the testers that eliminate invalid solution candidates that were generated by our, our generator that provides us with, us with a guess on a solution. Well, these were a lot of generation and guesses. But anyway, you got the idea, right? Now let's see what Klingo has to say on this one. Again, we push the button, we get one uh, solution that of course respects all the constraints. And let's inspect this solution, but look at it from a visual perspective. Here we go, that's the solution we have. And this looks actually pretty good, right? So we have five queens on the board. We have no column that contains two queens that may attack each other, the same actually with the lines. And we can verify in the same way that no two queens are on the same uh, diagonal, right? Here, these, this, and this. So this is a solution. Cool. But nonetheless, note actually how different it was, right, from what we've done before. When looking at a backtracking or the idea of a backtracking algorithm, so where to put the queen, what to check. So when we really said how to solve the problem, well here the idea was truly to say what is the problem? What are the rules of the problem? And how can we use the generate and test methodology to implement that? So we're just posing the rules of the problem. We are declaring what the problem is and that's it. And that's what I like so much about the N Queens problem. It nicely reflects, at least this solution nicely reflects this, this paradigm of uh, declarative problem solving. All in all, I'd say that we have obtained quite a nice encoding. On the one hand, it nicely reflects the generate and test methodology of ASP with the generator here in the third line and the testers that follow. And on the other hand, it also nicely reflects, I'd say, uh, the N Queens puzzle by 
uh, posing all uh, constraints that are required to be satisfied by a solution. So in terms of communication, this is a very nice encoding and it's always good to have such a, let's say, easy encoding as a reference encoding to communicate, right? So if you, again, talking about a bit industrial practice, if you do ASP with, with a client, you want to show actually uh, that the constraints are mirrored in your encoding and having a co uh, an encoding like this always uh, is very nice for that. But of course, there's room for improvement, right? And indeed, they can, such encodings can not only be uh, optimized, but then they also tend to run actually quite faster. So what, what room for improvement is here in this encoding? In principle, I'd say there are two, two different categories of improvements. The first one is logical, but the question is, have we actually posed our constraints or formulated our constraints in an effective way or are they redundant? And in fact, there is redundancy here. Because on the one hand, we require that uh, each solution has exactly n queens. And on the other hand here, for instance, with the horizontal and the vertical attacks, we require that there are never two or more queens on the same line or row. And but thinking of this, this actually means that there has to be exactly one queen on each line or each row, respectively. But if we already require that there is exactly one queen per row or line, then we don't have to require explicitly that there are also n queens on the board because this is an implicitly enforced because there are n rows so if we require that each of them contains a queen, there must be n queens. And the same, again, rows and lines are symmetric, right? So this is a logical improvement that we, at least I haven't been talking about so far. Perhaps you spotted that already. Anyway, the next one has to do with the size of the grounding. So keep in mind that when we ground, we have to substitute all possible values for each variable. So let's look again at this integrity constraint here, which forbids horizontal attacks. So roughly speaking, so we say that whenever we put a queen on a line and there are n possibilities to put this queen, we cannot put another queen on the same line. And then there are still n minus one possibilities. But anyway, this is a quadratic, this has, this leads to a quadratic blow up. Not to talk about the fact that here for the diagonals we use actually four different variables where fortunately once you have determined three the fourth one is, is, is fixed so you get actually here a cubic a cubic uh, explosion in space and if you just think of well I don't know a thousand queens right you have for these guys you get a million of instances well, not to talk about these ones. Anyway, this is another, another source where one should look carefully and ask oneself, is there a more space effective way uh, to formulate these constraints? And yes, there is, as I will show you next. Have you heard it? This was my doorbell. It was a perfect delivery. The postmaster just rang the doorbell at exactly the time between two encodings. Now, Let's get back to the other encoding that I promised you. So anyway, this encoding reflects the improvements I've been discussing earlier. So the first two rules um, impose that in each line and each column, we can put exactly one queen, or we have to put exactly one queen. Now let's just look at this or examine this a little bit more with the first one that talks about the lines. So for each line among one to n, we look at all the positions a queen can have in this line. And then among these n positions, exactly one has to be chosen, right? Just as an example, let's say we have, we solved our five queens puzzle. And let's say we now look at uh, line uh, three. Then I is instantiated with three and then we have we have substituted here the three and then we have all the positions uh, three one three two three 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 four three five oops i made it and among these five positions we are allowed to select or we must actually select exactly one and the same happens here in the second line uh, for the rows or the columns right and now by by requiring that each column has exactly one queen and each row has exactly one queen 
And since there are n of them, we implicitly require that we put exactly n queens on the board. So this is more or less the first logical improvement. Now the fact that we also now combine the, um, the generator with, uh, with these constraints, well again, it, it makes the encoding more compact, but as I argued before, um, it does not really have an effect on performance and it's mainly readability, readability because the solver will uncompile this again. Anyway, where grounding is then much more reduced, oh, but before I go on perhaps, let's look at grounding, right? So, before we had a quadratic number of rules. So here we have a linear number of rules because for each line we get one such rule. Admittedly, each rule then contains n atoms, but the number of rules has reduced from quadratic to linear. And this is also the same, but from cubic to linear with the, with the, with the integrity constraints forbidding two or more queens in the same, in the same uh, diagonals. Again, we have here this, uh, this, uh, this formula, which I hope you, that you played a little bit with uh, before. So here we enumerate diagonals, again, in a, in a mystic way, right? From, but there are two, two, two times n diagonals in both cases. And then we look at all the queens, or all the positions on the diagonals in both, in, both, in both angles. And it must not be the case, just to underline, it must not be the case that two or more diagonals two or more queens are sitting on the same diagonal. That's the trick. And again, we look at each diagonal, so we have a linear number of, uh, of rules rather than a cubic one, and here we may then face, admittedly, a linear number of atoms. But again, this is not only now in terms of, of, of rules much more compact, but also the grounding of this is much more compact. Anyway, I think this is actually my most preferred encoding. You can do still a little a tiny improvement, but this will actually lead to a longer encoding, and that's why I don't want to show this to you. Anyway, let's actually see how this improved encoding, which I'm not showing you, uh, actually works. And this one is not much slower, right? So I did this a couple of years back, so here it is. Sometimes it rocks, right? So this is now looking at the 5,000 queens example. This is the slightly enhanced, um, enhanced uh, version of the last encoding. And here I'm doing some configurations of the solving. So this is a Klingo, and, or better, clasp underneath comes with pre-configurations. And here I use the configuration jumpy. Otherwise, there's tweety and frumpy and, and jumpy, right? And jumpy is a bit, uh, an, 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 let's say, uh, an aggressive uh, or um, configuration that redoes is very active in, 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 and, and changes things on the fly and stuff like this and um, anyway and minus q just says that oh I don't want to print the solution right and minus minus stats equal two just says oh I want the maximum number of statistics you can actually look at all these parameters and calling Klingo with the option minus minus help and there are actually three levels. So you can go to minus minus help equal three and then you will see a lot of options. And actually the first thing that you will do is use a pager like more or less to, to be able to read them. Anyway, I zip it now. Now, solving this um, 5,000 queens problem in this setting works in roughly an hour, right? Uh, which I, th I find pretty impressive. And what you see here, it, it's two, well, actually a little bit more than half of the time was used uh, solving it and hence the other time was used uh, grounding it. So just look at, at what the problem actually that we get after grounding. So we have, well, 100 million rules and 75 million atoms. That's quite a big, a big uh, problem. And the, the solver to find the solution made, well, let me just check, 288 million choices. So you can imagine roughly a search tree with 288 million uh, internal nodes. Okay, that's quite a lot. But anyway, uh, such a big problem can be solved by, by, by Klingo in, 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 in roughly an hour. And this shows you also a bit the performance of, of the size of problems that can be dealt with. And we will discuss these statistics a bit more in, in the chapter called Adv Advanced uh, Modeling. We actually take up the Queen's problem again, but in between we will first learn of how the algorithms work, how the implementation works, that we can actually also interpret these statistics and get hints on where to improve the encoding. 
Okay, now this closes the, the subsection on the N-Queen's problem and we will next look at the traveling salesperson problem.